to make sense of some of this, we're going to draw on some things that you probably remember from world history. So I'm going to run you through a few basic things that you probably covered back then just to refresh your memory. The reason that we're doing this is that mythology, specifically the biblical mythology, is something that is well known by the three major religions. So Islam, Christianity, and uh, Judaism, all of them are very familiar with Christian mythology. And therefore, lots of different authors, including Ray Bradbury in four, Fahrenheit 451, make allusions to these particular books. So I just want to give you some quick background on civilizations, why it matters, and then lead you to some of the texts that you're going to read. As you remember from world history, the first civilization that developed that was not nomadic developed in modern day Iraq. And again, it was in the Fertile Crescent, the area between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. And again, the big important thing to remember about this is that stable agriculture allows a civilization to be stable. Once you have people in one place, you're going to need things like rules and laws and explanations for why things have to be. And so the mythology followed very shortly after the settlements became permanent. Because again, you have to explain to people why things are the way that they are. And that's what myths are. They're explanatory st stories that are religious in nature. So the first civilization that we look at in this particular area is the Sumerians. And the Sumerians were the first to develop things like writing and laws and government. And again, stable agriculture is so important because when you have food and you don't have to be nomadic and go out and get it, you have to be able to, again, organize things like trade, behavior, why things are done according to the way that they are, and to explain things like why sometimes it's a fertile time and why not so much. And so Samaria was the first culture in which we see writing and laws and government in this area. If you remember from our discussion of uh, things fall apart, we talked about Hubert and Harriet and had you make the little ducks, and we talked about what happens when different groups collide. Well, in that area between the Tigris and the Euphrates, there were a lot of different cultures that developed. And remember, unlike today where you can make a trek from Hampton to Newport News to York County, and we all share the same language and the same culture, changing even five miles right, or ten miles outside of where someone lived meant that the culture changed, the practices changed, their beliefs changed completely. So there were a number of different ethnic groups that rose up and strove for dominance in this small area. Right? So the Sumerians were the first, and we're going to see the Sumerians fall to the Akkadians, and the Akkadians fall to the Babylonians as one after another kind of rises up and becomes more dominant in this area. Sumerian society was stratified, meaning that you had a class that was at the top, right? class that was at the bottom, and the way that they differentiated was the closer to the ziggurat, and again the ziggurat is the prayer center, the closer to the ziggurat, the higher the class. And again, the hierarchy is important because this is facilitating a way of organizing people, a way of controlling people, you classify them, and therefore you're making a society that functions. And so the Sumerians were one of the first groups that created this kind of hierarchical, which means a level, of classes. So the ziggurat, again, was the temple, and it's the center of Sumerian life. So again, the closer you were to this ziggurat, the higher your social class. So there was an upper class, a middle class, and then the poor. And again, the closer you were to this main central area, the higher your social class. And we even see that kind of thing today. There are certain neighborhoods that are known as to be more prestigious than others. And so living in that neighborhood is a sign of your social class. And again, these are all just ways to organize people. And you'll notice that religion, right, how close you are to the ziggurat, how often you can pray, and your religious knowledge is a way of stratification. 
And so for as far back as the Sumerians, the people with the more access to religion and religious knowledge are going to be the people who are seen as privileged. So the Sumerians developed writing, and their writing was called cuneiform, and what they did was to press little wedges into wet clay to form symbols. Um, it was a very complete system of writing, meaning that they had ways to express lots of different words and concepts. Um, we actually have Sumerian writing that remains that we have translated. And again, this is one of the things that's important because when you can write down literature, when you can write down information, when you can write down history, when you can write down laws, the civilization becomes much stronger. You're also going to need things like mythology to make that culture come together. Why do we practice certain things? Well, here's the reason why. And so a lot of the early Sumerian writings, again, explain things like law or explain religious phenomena. So the Sumerians are a civilization that gets talked about in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, again, it's a story that teaches how you cannot have immortality. Um, it tells a story very similar to Noah's Ark. And again, it explains why people die, um, why uh, certain things happen, um, and that one should never believe that he or she can be immortal. And so again, it's a story very similar to Noah's Ark in many ways. Uh, but the Sumerian culture is eventually going to fall to the Akkadians. So one group is going to take over another. The Akkadians took over the Sumerian culture and blended it with their own. And they too, again, had many religious practices that needed explanation and justification. One of the practices in their government was called king for a day to prevent corruption in the government. It didn't literally mean that you were king for a day. What it meant was that for a period of a year, there was one ruler. Just like today we have term limits, they had king for a day, where you were only king for that year, but then after your time was up, you would be executed. And the idea behind this would be to prevent corruption. If you knew you were only ruling for a year, why would you make decisions that were selfish or self-serving? So again, just like modern day term limits, they created this rule, they wrote it down in order to explain the practices in their government. So the beginning of the end of the Akkadian civilization is with the King Sargon the Great. He takes the kingship that's offered from him. And again, his point is, well, at least I'll be king for the year and I have nothing to lose. If I don't try, they're going to execute me. If I try, the worst thing that can happen is that I die. And Sargon the Great took control of the Akkadian army and built a great city-state. And again, abolished that practice of the king for a day. And so the Akkadians adopted a lot of the Sumerian traditions. They, they codified, which means to wrote, write down, various kinds of laws. And what we see is that each culture adapts the religion adapts the stories of those that came before. So the story that's very similar to Noah and the flood about how God punishes those who are not righteous and will cause a giant flood, all of those kinds of stories get passed on as one culture absorbs another. Another culture that's going to spring up um, is the Babylonians. And the Babylonians were united under Hammurabi and the person Hammurabi was very interested with creating a culture in which all people knew the law and could not deny knowing the law to get out of punishment. And so Hammurabi wanted people to know all of the laws and he displayed these on blocks of stone that were eight feet high so everyone could see them and know them. And again, they explained the laws and justified them. So again, the word codified again means to be written down. So you can see, for example, in this picture, they set up some of the laws, the things that are acceptable and not acceptable. And we're familiar with Hammurabi because we usually call them the eye for an eye laws. So again, if somebody was to blind you, the punishment was to blind the other person. So if somebody uh, killed someone, their punishment would be execution or death. 
And the point behind all of this stuff is as one culture absorbs another and absorbs another and absorbs another, they have to justify their laws. They have to justify their religious practices, explain why certain things happen. And so the literature and the religion are very close together. So too are the laws, because you have to explain why certain things are done according to religious practices. Another group that settled along the coast, um, as opposed to in the middle of, of Iraq, um, were a group known as the Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians were seafarers, so they would be like in present day Lebanon, as opposed to in Iraq in the Fertile Crescent. And they were important because they spread some of their laws and the alphabet and their culture beyond the Middle East. So from here, they would travel to Turkey, they would travel beyond Turkey over to Greece. They traveled to Cyprus. They traveled to Egypt. Um, the Phoenicians were known for a lot of things, including uh, the color purple dye uh, that they had invented. Uh, but they also were important because their language is a predecessor of Greeks and, and Latin languages. So again, not only did they spread their, their laws, and their culture and their alphabet, of course, they too are going to spread some of their religious practices. And so we see that as people encounter different groups, they have to adopt, explain, and understand certain practices. And so with the exploring that goes on during this time period, there's a lot of exchange of different cultural stories. And so we're gonna see that in a lot of these Middle Eastern kinds of stories, they are very similar tales that get propagated or passed on from culture to culture. So here are some examples of the Phoenicians' various trade routes. So they would start in Lebanon, um, and they would go to Turkey. They might travel to Greece, and then they'd travel to Italy. Uh, they'd stop in Carthage, and even beyond. And so again, it's spreading language and literature and culture through trade. So it's one of the reasons why it was important that these laws and their religion was codified, meaning written down, so that it could be shared with other people. So then we get to the story of Abraham. In the book of Genesis, which is in the Old Testament of the Bible, it tells us how Abraham is summoned to go to Canaan, right? And he is given the commandment by God that Abraham is to go to Canaan. And there he will found a people who believe in just one God. And in return, right, they have to believe in one God, adhere to certain religious practices, and in return, they will have God's favor and be rewarded with a homeland of their very own which again sounds wonderful. The problem comes in, of course, is that we just talked about how all of these ancient civilizations were already there. So when Abraham arrives in Canaan, there are already people. There are different religious groups like the Philistines who are there. There are a bunch of different people already there. So as Abraham arrives and says, okay, I will found this belief and religion, there are a lot of people who resist because again, part of Abraham's teaching says that they are going to be rewarded with a homeland for God's favor. So Abraham, the Hebrew patriarch, the kind of founding father, they go into Canaan with Abraham's sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And again, there's a big problem. When they get to the promised land, there's already the Canaanites there and the Philistines. And so they live in Canaan for four generations and they're not treated very well when they live there. Obviously, they're seen as kind of encroachers. They think that they have the right to this because God has promised. And again, the people who are already there see their claims as foolish. So ultimately, the famine is going to force these Israelites to migrate into Egypt. Right? Um, Abraham, again, is the Hebrew patriarch 
who is going to set up some of the tenets of the faith. The word tenet means the beliefs. So he sets up the main kind of beliefs of the religion, and he also articulates the rewards, right, the homeland, um, the favor of God, and some of the other, of course, benefits that have been promised to his people through God's covenant. So Abraham, again, is known as the first kind of patriarch of the Judaic religion because of his commitment to founding a belief in a religion focused on one God. So one of the big problems that we're going to see is that there's a lot of discrimination against the Jews, against Abraham and his people. They originate in Sumeria, but then travel to the coast where they're not well received by the people who live there. And so again, a lot of people who see Abraham coming to this land and saying, God promised us this place as being a quack, right? And so it becomes very important for Abraham to propagate this and to convert people into believing in the tenets of his faith. So Judaism is monotheistic, that there is one God, uh, often ca called either Jehovah or Yahweh, and this one God guides the destinies of the Jewish people. Right? Unlike some other polytheistic religions, religion becomes a part of their way of life. Right? They have to obey certain contractual obligations, and in return for that, they will achieve salvation and this homeland. So some of the rules, we can see why they were both functional and considered a dictum by God. So for example, they separate their milk plate and their meat. In a time when food isn't pasteurized, it makes sense that you wouldn't want to have a cheeseburger. There could be contamination in the meat. And then with the cheese, you're going to have things like mold. And so you put those two things together and it's a recipe for disaster. And so there were certain dietary laws that they had to abide by. There were certain social practices that God requested or required and certain rules that were established. And the writing of these rules right, becomes part of the Old Testament. Right? Explaining how people came to be, why they have to behave in certain ways, and what sorts of things God expects. So the Old Testament is shared by both the Christians and the Jews. Right? Both believe that this is the story of, again, how God wants his people to live. Right? So when the Jews show up in Egypt, they are enslaved. Right? It is not a happy time for them and they still do not have the homeland that has been promised. So Moses leads the Israelites from Egypt and they of course have to wander around in the desert because no quest is easy. Moses receives the Torah, including the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. Right? So again, in the Ten Commandments, God communicates directly with Moses the things that he requests and requires. And all of these eventually will need to be written down in a way that people can have access to them. And this is, again, essentially what the Old Testament does. It explains God's promises and, of course, what he expects. So again, in Egypt, they are not welcome. They eventually escape enslavement, and then they're going to go back to Cana, where they came from. And again, when they arrive there, they're still those same groups that were there when they left, and they're no more receptive this time. So the quest for the homeland has been a common problem for the Jews for years. So Moses, again, is the one who receives the Ten Commandments. He leads the people from Egypt. And again, even once they return, they have to struggle to create a kingdom, right? And again, once they get their kingdom created, they have a temple that they build. Um, they're immediately sacked by the Babylonians. And again, this is just a constant reminder that the homeland that has been promised to them by God contractually has not yet been filled. And yet they still have to remain faithful in order to be promised or and provided with that homeland.
And you can still see the Wailing Wall of the Temple of Jerusalem. There's only one wall of that original temple that remains. And it's just a reminder of this perpetual quest to find a place to call home. So the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar uh, conquers them and the, the people who are in Jerusalem are taken to Babylon as slaves. So while in Babylon, many of the Jews write songs right, of their faith and some of these psalms or songs all revolve around this idea of keeping faith alive. Even though people might sneer at their practices, call them silly, denigrate, or call their religion nasty names, they are going to celebrate their religion and maintain that faith. So on your study guide, one of the questions is about one of the Psalms in which the speaker says, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. So literally, you can take my hand or let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I forget my religion, if I forget my God, if I forget my uh, desire to go back to Jerusalem and escape captivity. Eventually, right, uh, the Persian Empire is going to take over and the Jews that are living in Babylon are liberated, but a lot of them scatter into the diaspora. They don't want to go back to where they came from because, of course, nobody liked them there to begin with. And so the Persians take over, and there's about 350 years of Persian domination in the Middle East. One of the questions that gets asked a lot, of course, is that why is there so much anti-Semitism in history? Why is there kind of a hatred of the Jews? And the answer to that kind of lies in a couple of things. First of all, right, the Jews had no prohibitions against usury. Usury is selling or loaning money at an interest. So you loan money, but you make money off of this. Um, and again, because of this, they had no prohibitions against it, a lot of the early Jews were bankers, people who were money lenders. And money lenders, or people to whom we owe money, tend to be our least favorite people. And so throughout history, we see a long, long history of rulers who will ask Jews for money, take the money to finance campaigns, or some kind of quest that they want to go on, and then they'll make the dictum kicking all Jews out of the country so they no longer have to pay them back. They were also some of the first to make uh, very big uh, inroads in medicine and education, and so they were highly sought after in some respects, but at the same token, there was a lot of animosity towards them because of their in advancement. And a lot of that has led to animosity and hatred. And of course, even genocide in the Holocaust, as Hitler blamed the Jews and their hoarding of money for some of the economic problems in Germany. So after the Holocaust, part of the idea was that the Hebrews, or the Jews, needed that homeland created. So after World War II, they carved out the state of Israel, right? a Jewish state. Palestine is a part of that newly created Israeli state. And most of the people who live in Palestine are Muslim. So you're putting Muslims under Israeli law. And again, this has created years and years of conflict where Muslims want to live under Muslim law and don't want to be subjected to the law of Judaic rule. And again, part of this is because we in the Western world have separation of church and state. We don't really understand it. But again, when you have a culture whose laws and religion are bound, it's much, much more difficult to have any kind of secular nation state. These are all religious kinds of national government. So the rise of Islam led to a number of problems in the Middle East. 
right? The Islamic faith accepts Jesus as a prophet, but not the son of God, in the same way that Judaic uh, faith accepts Jesus as a prophet, but not the son of God. So a lot of their holy sites, especially in what is contemporary Israel, are considered holy by all of the religions, and they all want to preserve this peace for their own people. So the Wailing Wall, right, what's left of the temple, is holy to the Jews, and right next to it is the Dome of the Rock, which the Muslims hold sacred. And so there's a lot of hostility because each group wants to have the kind of control of the national government. And in the case of Palestine, the Muslims want to live under Muslim rule, even though it's technically a part of the Israeli nation state. So again, with Islam, as well as when we're looking at the state of Israel, there's no separation of church and state. You live under Judaic law, you live under the laws of Islam, and again, uh, the Sharia is the name for that Islamic law. And again, there's no secular rule like we have today. So you can be whatever religion, and the law is going to be secular. This is a kind of religious nation state. And this is one of the reasons why today there's so much conflict in Israel. Yet ironically, they share a lot of the same kind of values, some of the same books even in the Bible when you look at Jews and Christians. And again, there's a lot of conflict even though many of these groups share the same kind of religious ideas and even religious books. So the Christians and the Jews share the Old Testament as a common set of beliefs. Uh, Muslims believe that Jesus was a prophet, but not that he was the son of God. Uh, but again, all of them have an idea that God will reward the faithful. Each one of these religions has a scripture that is holy, um, and each of them believe in prayer and the forgiveness of sins. How they go about that is a little bit different. So, when we look at the Bible, right, it's divided into the Old Testament and the New Testament. And as I said, both Christians and the Jews hold the Old Testament as sacred. So, who wrote the Old Testament? Where did it come from? The Old Testament is a collection of stories that were written down by various different authors. And these stories supposedly tell of creation, how the world was made, uh, how people were made, why there is sin, um, and also provide some role models and ways to behave according to God's word. Now, in the New Testament, we'll see that it's mostly the stories of the miracles of Jesus recorded long after his birth. So, there are a number of works that are considered non-canonical. Non-canonical means that these particular biblical stories weren't included in the compilation of either the Old or the New Testament. And again, some stories are ones that contradicted others. Some stories couldn't be authenticated, meaning that there were different versions and so they went with one version instead of the others. Or there were some stories that seemed to conflict some of the other ones, so they didn't want to put that in. So an example of an apocryphal story um, there is in the story of Genesis, the story of the first creation, and not Eve, but Lilith is the first woman. And Lilith refuses to listen, Lilith refuses to behave, and so Lilith runs away and ends up spawning children with demons. And again, it explains where evil comes from and explains the punishment that comes when you don't uh, value what God tells you and you go against his expressed commands. And so that's an example of a non-canonical book in the Bible that's not actually in the Old Testament, but again, a lot of people know it because it was passed down generation after generation even though it wasn't included. So when we look at the story of the Middle East, it's a story essentially of one culture coming in and dominating another. Right? So when the Jews eventually return from Babylon, the land gets repeatedly conquered by the Greeks um, and then the Romans. 
And as we know from the story of Jesus' crucifixion, the interaction between the Jews and the uh, captors, the, the Romans, um, were not always civil or peaceable. So throughout this time, there are lots of stories, again, explaining God's promises, explaining how people should live, and that these captivities that they go through are simply trials that God wishes for people to endure. The Romans, again, rule for quite some time until the Persian invasion. And again, the Persian or the Byzantine rule um, is going to change the religion of the, the Middle East altogether from the kind of Roman uh, religion and their mythology to a much more uh, kind of Arab mythology. And so when we look at these stories, it's important to realize that the entirety of the Middle East, the history, is one of conflict and conquest. So these stories that were codified or written down were important as cultures tried to justify behaviors, right, because God said so, and justify laws because God commanded it. And so that's what these religions were trying to do, is to create ways of understanding or knowing the world. So in the New Testament, we're going to see a number of different kinds of prophets um, and charismatic uh, figures who basically warned of things that would happen, right? So a lot of the prophets, again, were seen as divine foreseers of the future. And again, there are prophets in the Old Testament as well who, who foresee the coming of the Christ figure um, and who give detailed instructions to people as to how to behave. So just to kind of reiterate, the Old Testament is what we're going to be reading some stories from. It's sacred to both the Hebrews and the Christian. And again, the books of the Old Testament, there's several different sections and types of writing. Um, the first five books is called the Torah. Then there are some books telling the history of the Israelites. So again, that would tell the history of Abraham. That's where we get the story of Abraham and Isaac, if you know that one, where he's asked to sacrifice his son. Then there are some poems and wisdom books, which again tell people to keep on keeping on, even of course if they are in some kind of a, a tough spot like captivity in Babylon. And then in book four, again, that's or part four, there's the biblical prophets who talk about how not to uh, reject the teachings of God. And so again, in terms of things to know about the Bible, there are different authors for all of these different pieces or parts. And again, different faiths accept and reject certain texts and inclusions. Those are called the Apocrypha. But the Old Testament is what we're going to read some things from today. So specifically, the books that tell the history and how things came to be. And again, these are origin myths. So in the New Testament, we have the narratives of the life of Christ, right? And it's told through various gospels. Um, and these various gospels, again, are ones that tell of the coming of Christ and his uh, resurrection. Um, and the Gospels are, we know them generally as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the order of their writing is Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. And each narrative, differs from the other in many different kinds of ways. And again, a lot of people point to that as changes that happen over time since these stories were written down much, much after the death of, of Christ. Um, other people see it as just uh, small variations based on um, it, little inaccuracies, um, little things that people remember in different ways. Another part of the New Testament is a narrative of what the apostles did, those who pre preached the gospel of, of Christ. There's also 21 letters, which are called epistles, um, and these are letters about what the, the Christian religion should do. And the last book, of course, is Revelations that has prophecies about the end of the world. So in terms of, of this, right, um, Christians take the Old and New Testament as part of the word of God. Right? Um, even though these accounts were written many years after Christ's uh, birth and death, um, these particular stories are included in their holy texts, whereas the Hebrew people would only see the Old Testament as their uh, kind of holy book. 
So in your text, you're going to read a couple of different stories. You're going to read Genesis, which is all about creation, how people were created, how sin arrived in the world. Uh, there's also two different versions of creation in the text, which you'll notice that those two things don't even agree with one another. Um, and again, people would point to this as a sign of, you know, the mythology being fragmented or, um, or false. But one of the things to remember about these various stories is that they're all trying to explain. And so in various different portions of the piece, you're going to see different explanations that are given for these natural phenomena. You're also going to read the story of Noah and the flood, which explains, again, God's promise to his people, um, how people can lead to the destruction of the world if they are too wicked, um, and innumerable other small things, like why certain racial groups are considered superior to others. And in the book of Ruth, we get the story of a faithful wife who, rather than deserting her mother-in-law, who can't support herself, chooses to, in an act of what we would call girl power, bond with her mother-in-law and go out in search of a husband. It's really a story about faith um, and about having faith in yourself and in others, um, and that faith ultimately being rewarded by God, who sees the sacrifices that people make for others um, and is willing to reward that sacrifice. And then you're going to read the Psalms. And again, those Psalms are those songs of praise. Um, some of them are songs about not forgetting religion and captivity, but all of them are designed to, again, teach some kind of lesson about the religion and not forgetting it. But a Psalm, again, is a lyric poem. It's a song generally of praise of some kind. So that's what you need to know about the foundation of the Bible. Just that, again, most religions and most cultures are familiar with these stories. They've been passed down from generation to generation. Most people are familiar with the stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament, again, because each group finds different portions of them as important to understanding what it is that God wants of his people.